All right, so welcome to the inaugural uh, Encrypt Sid. I've got some family that are just leaving to go to the pool at the moment. So if you hear any um, screams of delight in the background, that is why. Um, uh, you probably heard us sort of talking a little bit up until now, but uh, I'm Lindsay and I'm also joined here by Marina and Dan. Um, and we're the, uh, the, the co-organizers of the meetup. And that's uh, really great to have all of you here. Um, particularly in this uh, somewhat unusual COVID times, but uh, you know, wear your friendly faces, the folks that organize this. Um, before I start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia, which in my case is the Duck and Young people, and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters, and culture. We pay our respect to their elders, past and present. Sovereignty has never been ceded and treaties have never been signed. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Well, as I said, welcome to the inaugural meetup. Uh, you're you're all getting the first glimpse of the uh, the new Encrypted logo. Um, so I, I'm sure you can you can get the visual imagery right there when I'm getting that. But um, I was quite proud to be able to put that together and have something nice and custom for our first meetup. So lovely to have you all here. Uh, ten of us, which is really great to see. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll just get bigger and better over time. Um, Quick primer on our code of contact for the meetup. I'm just going to skip through it uh, a little bit quickly, but uh, just to reinforce that we don't tolerate harassment of the meetup participants in any form or communication to be appropriate for professional audiences. And please remember that uh, harassment and sexist, racist, or exclusionary jokes are not appropriate at Encrypted. It's really important that we make this a welcoming and friendly event and series of events for everybody. And uh, it's really great to have all of you here um, to be part of that here with, uh, with our first event that we're kicking off. So um, probably, you know, want to hear a little bit about why we're doing this in the first place. And uh, I thought I'd, I'd hand over to, to Marina and Dan to uh, talk a little bit about the motivation for why we're even doing this thing in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. So we uh, had previously a crypto party and uh, have been renamed a couple of times this meetup. And I think uh, the goal uh, remains the same, just to have a, a friendly environment, uh, to be able to exchange ideas, uh, to receive feedback, uh, any kind of it, and just to, again, uh, share information and um, ideas with a wider audience. Dan, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I mean, I second those comments. For me, I think, um, I mean, firstly, cryptography is really cool. And um, I'm frustrated that every time people talk about crypto these days, they talk about Web3 and blockchain. And that's not what this is about. This is the OG crypto in my mind. Um, it's like, you know, they stole our word. Uh, <laughs> but uh, having said that, we, we do have a talk from somebody um, on uh, the cryptography involved in some of Web3 technologies tonight. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, but the thing that I'm really interested in personally is the role cryptography plays in, in um, securing uh, the applications that we use. And so I think um, a lot of developers in the community that I, I know don't know a whole lot about cryptography. And um, I'm really excited to, to share more about it um, so that more people understand it. And hopefully together we can make a more secure and safe world. So that's, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, I should, I suppose I should probably explain a little bit about why I'm here as well. So I'm, I'm Lindsay. I'm, uh, I work with Dan, actually. Uh, we both work together at, at a new uh, Sydney-based startup called Cypherstash. Uh, but we're treating this as a very distinct event from what we're doing with Cypherstash. We're doing it because we love the technology and we love the exchange of ideas. And we think it's really important that there's a strong community that really understands the technology and the maths behind it. Um, and also you know, the practical implications of it. So that, you know, I've been running meetups for uh, 12 years i've been running the sydney devops meetup um for 12 years next week actually which is the longest devops meetup in the world and uh i thought ah oh, 12 years of that time for something new and, and here we are doing uh doing encrypted um we've got some pretty bold aspirations for what we want to try and do here you know that we delayed a bit we really wanted to do this six months um six months ago but the uh with the pandemic and everything it just wasn't quite safe and we sort of put a stake in the ground and, and here we are on in february 2022 um it's a bit of a last minute change of plans to do it online but um it's great to see that we can at least get more folks turn up um and something that I've sort of learned in the, in the last two years of running events online as well is that the uh, doing online events opens you up to a whole bunch of different uh, interesting speakers. Um, so, you know, we can get folks in from overseas and whatnot. In fact, we, we've had some um, very brief chats about, uh, you know, how we expand the scope. So it isn't just people in industry, but also people in academia as well. So 
um, one of the interesting opportunities um, as we roll into into winter is um, uh, uh, lunch and learns, uh, particularly with overseas guests in different time zones. Um, so yeah, there's uh, there's there's potentially some really cool options there for for getting a broader range of speakers with a bunch of different topics. So yeah, I'm really excited about the community side of things, and that's uh, that's why we're all here, really. All right, well, that's the spiel. Um, Les Marina, Dan, you want to add anything to that? It's great. Perfect. Yeah, I think we can proceed to our um, lightning talks today. Yeah, let's do it. Um, oh, actually, one last thing to mention, um, in-person meetups, we want them to start really soon, as soon as it's safe. Um, so we're about to, you know, we, we would have loved to have done it today, but, um, you know, expect it, you know, if, if not the next one, uh, preferably the next one, but if not, like the one after that. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Lindsay, to, remember, uh, to remind me about that. Uh, Prosper, the company I'm working with, very happy to host, and they've been very happy to host today. It just, we want everyone to uh, stay safe, like the safety on the first priority. And when we'll be happy to do that, then... I hope we will enjoy drinks at Frostbite. Yeah, exactly. You know, for, first start securing ourselves and then we can start securing our data. <laughs> All right. So the uh, agenda for tonight is the intro. It's the thing that you've been listening to for the last seven minutes. Uh, then we're going to roll into a lightning talk. Uh, we're going to do a quick overview of interesting uh, crypto related events that are happening um, over the next sort of couple of months. Uh, both domestic and abroad. Uh, and then we're going to roll into the second lightning talk of the night. Now, if you saw the announcement yesterday, you noticed that there was only one lightning talk, but we've snuck in an extra one just to give you a little bit of extra, uh, extra bit of content there um, for, you know, as a reward for turning up on the first, uh, the first meetup. So really great to have all of you here. Um, the two talks tonight. So the first is we've got Jane Zaki talking about cryptographic algorithms used in Web3. And then we've got uh, Dan Draper talking about why authentication matters in cryptography. Um, I'm going to skip over the next bit. We'll actually jump into it during the uh, during the next talk. But I actually just want to roll straight into the first talk. Let's just uh, let's just get the show on the road. So, um, James, I'm going to stop screen sharing and give control over to you, and take it Excellent. away when you're ready. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah. So I'm not uh, like heap strong on crypto algorithms, but I have been working in the Web3 space for a while, and I'm familiar with at least the names of the algorithms. And, and I'm just setting the bar that low. So anything more than the names is, is a bonus. So let's start with that. Um, so I'm basically going to jump straight into uh, the well, my slides being tabs. Um, so this is going to be a presentation by by browser. Uh, so you, can you all see that? Okay. It's looking great. Great, great. So, so the first one's, um, yeah, elliptic curve or oh, ECDSA. Like I, I don't often say the whole thing, so I'm probably going to garble it. So ECDSA um, signatures are used for uh, both Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, wallets. Um, there is, you know, some beautiful stuff in there around elliptic curve cryptography that I don't know. It makes beautiful pictures. And you'll have to forgive me, I'm literally going to be that deep on that one because I don't know too much more than it's just what everything has been using um, for Ethereum or for Bitcoin addresses and Ethereum addresses. And there's a very nice um, tool uh, or site basically called uh, Ian Coleman. So uh, is that, there we are. Uh, Ian Coleman's got a, a bunch of things in there that are quite cool. So if you haven't heard of that, like around Shamir Secret Sharing, I really like that. That's a lot of fun. Um, but to stick on topic, let's go up to the BIP39 um, mnemonic code uh, converter. So generally, an Ethereum wallet uh, will have, uh, you know, uh, if you're using some of the libraries out there, they'll just make you something with um, 12 words, generally the English dictionary. And from that, it will create um, a seed phrase, root key. Uh, sorry, that's the US seed phrase. Well, this is often referred to as a seed phrase, but we found like just some interesting points around when crypto terminology reaches users. Uh, when you say something like seed phrase, it doesn't sound like private password. So there was actually a lot of usability issues and a lot of theft with hackers convincing people to share their seed phrases because it doesn't sound thing. So they've re renamed that to call it something like um, secret private phrase or something like that. Um, so that's just an interesting thing. If you ever have a term that's very accurate and it reaches users and it doesn't sound like it has the, the privacy level it should, then yeah, just consider the name of that. Um, yeah, they, they do say um, sort of the blockchain space is a bit of the wild west. And, and I think for reasons like that, it, it kind of 
um, is evident. But uh, but with that root key um, from the secret phrase, um, you can generate a set of addresses. Oh, so let's put that to type Ethereum. Where are we? Um, let's spin up above. Uh, where are we? Show. Hmm, there we are. So here there's all the different types of networks that use it. So there's a lot of uh, copy paste that goes on with these things, which is also another reason the security can be quite bad, like not, not just the um, cryptographic part, that's generally solid. So when you copy paste you know, a base library and use it, that's fine. Um, but you've got people who copy sort of surface level code applications and do tweaks to them and then things break there. So uh, uh, here, here we have a lot of networks that are based on Ethereum or Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, which is the sort of the history of it. Bitcoin started, then um, Litecoin was a, a fork or a copy of Bitcoin. Um, you have Ethereum, you have a, a lot of other Ethereum clones. But basically you get addresses that look like this, which is um, 20 bytes um, that represent the address. And then you have under the hood, there's uh, the public key and the private key. But basically the address is deterministic, like a simplification of the public key. Um, I can't remember exactly how that worked. But it was, yeah, maybe a hash of part of it. Um, so that's, yeah, so that's the ECDSA, um, I guess, wallets, as they're called. And those can generate multiple ones. So based on that sort of branching uh, path that we saw earlier. So, uh, yeah, let's just jump ahead. So you can specify different accounts. Um, I think you increment there and you can see one uh, root key. Um, can have multiple addresses. And generally that's stored in hardware wallets. So um, that's a ledger, which is, there's also Trezor, there's other, maybe they're the two top popular ones. Um, and I guess you treat like that like any other secure hardware device. Um, make sure you get it from a good source. You can, you know, they provide, I think even uh, internal, so you can sh see the inside. Like if you were to open it, you could compare it to um, what you'd expect the internals to be to check if you've had a mo if someone's modded your hardware and put a chip on it or something. So yeah, there's good security with those things. Uh, for the, just out of curiosity, there's a if you're curious, there's a whole lot of uh, word list there. It's um, 2048 um, words, and that's what you write down on you know somewhere safe is sort of what they say. You can write down a piece of paper, keep it offline. Um, uh, yeah, I was going to share a. Is, is it like um, strictly five, 10 minutes or can I waffle for a tad? Should be okay. Yeah, for you, James, yeah. you can have at least 11 minutes. You can go a little bit over oh, if you nice. need to. You're too kind. <laughs> <laughs> right, so there was this interesting story recently of I don't know how many billion um, worth of Bitcoin um, that was stolen from an exchange um, was recovered by the FBI um, or yes, yeah, some, uh, some agency in America and they, you know, would have had a secure passphrase, maybe 12 or 24 words, depending, but they'd stored it on, an, on a cloud service um, behind a basic password. So whether there was, uh, you know, a backdoor to that cloud service or, and even if it was a password cloud service, still there was something there that was just being stored. And then uh, they were able to either brute force it or just use a backdoor to get that seed phrase. And with that seed phrase, they could recover billions um, of the stolen crypto. Um, so that was just a recent, recently in the news. The next thing I want to go on to that was um, kind of popular for one of the cryptocurrencies is zero knowledge proofs, and it continues to be um, used in different ways. But um, it's a way, I was going to say raise your hand if you've heard of it. Yeah, we'll skip that bit. <laughs> um, so zero knowledge proofs is a way of proving that you know something to someone without revealing what that something is. <laughs> nice. And uh, it's used, it was used in Zcash for a way to have anonymous crypto um, transfers or cr cryptocurrency transfers. Um, and the idea is, we could use a nice little picture here, uh, sort of one of the analogies that's used is that it's because it's an iterative proof, you, you won't be 100% sure of, um, of their knowledge of the thing, but you can get more and more certain the more you test. So these things, when they're running um, proofs, they sort of, Iterate. So the idea here uh, for this analogy is that someone on the outside of the cave um, wants to know if this person inside the cave knows the code to the door. So they'll just ask them, uh, come out. I should use my cursor here. Yeah, be like, I ask you to come out this side. And 
you know, they may be on one side of the door or the other, they don't know. And if they come out this side, you go, okay, you know, 50-50 chance they were already on that side. Then you can ask them something else, go, okay, go back in and I want you to come out the other side. And then you can just keep doing that. But at some point, they're not going to get lucky and be outside of the gate. At some point, they'll have to know the code to then pass the gate to come out the side you've requested. So that's sort of the analogy here that as after a while, you come, you keep asking them to come out the left door, right door, left side, right side. They'll it'll give you confidence if they're always getting it right, that they are able to pass this barrier um, and they have the code to the door, but you on the outside do not know the code to the door. So that's sort of the, you know, an analogy that's often used for that. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll keep an eye on the chat if there's any like little questions along the way, but otherwise I'll just keep going through. Yeah, feel free to just uh, keep powering through, James. And if there are any questions yeah. there, I'll, uh, I'll, I'm happy to voice them. Sweet, awesome. So uh, then there was, uh, I guess, between snarks and, yeah, uh, I might jump into that one because that was from the previous part. Do a 12 hours for a dictionary. Oh, yeah, it's so nice. Yeah, there's some good, um, yeah, there's some good uh, videos on, on the, uh, what's the ability to guess a uh, passphrase, something like that, or, or the ability of a collision, actually. This was for um, 256 bits. So a lot of the address, um, the, the data bytes uh, in there are 256 bits. So I think that's, uh, that's yeah, some other interesting um, video on that. Uh, so snarks uh, were, oh, I'm going to knock at this analogy. Um, succinct non-iterative argument. Ah, I'm going to have to step back. Argument of knowledge. I think AR is argument of knowledge. Um, that's going to be in the Wikipedia, isn't it? But uh, whereas the... Oh, Man, I should have had these definitions. Here we are. Succinct, yeah, sorry, zero knowledge, scalable, transparent argument of knowledge. The other one, it's not saying it. But anyway, Starks were, were um, sorry, Snarks required a setup. So I think with Zcash, they actually had a ceremony. And there's an interesting uh, podcast of that. So they recorded it. And um, the whole ceremony of uh, buying burner computers from random computer stores and then... Uh, you know, how they set them up and how they were doing a lot of entry by randomly mashing the keys under some cardboard so no one saw them, then burning it to a CD, passing it to the next one, sending that. And so there was this ceremony of the ring signatures. Um, and I don't know much more about that, but the ring signatures are used to set this up. So you did need a setup phase for snarks and you had to trust that they burned uh, or destroyed um, whatever was used when they created it. And they, again, they were always, they were filmed the whole thing to them destroying the computers. So if people have trust in that, they can have trust in the Zcash um, currency. Um, but then Starks came along, which I think were, um, yeah, which was smaller, but also didn't require the setup. And so with a setup like that, I think they refer to what you need to destroy as radioactive waste, because you just have to get rid of it and not keep it to, to sort of preserve the, the yeah, the, the ability for the, a malicious actor to generate random proofs. So yeah, the idea is that you will um, have something you want to prove. You can, and it's done via circuits. Um, again, I think there's. Hmm, is this going to show the circuits now? That's right. And yeah, so uh, yeah, so you um, you have something you want to prove. Um, you create a circuit such that it can take the input of any public parameters, but doesn't reveal any private parameters. And um, a verifier can use that to put in the public parameters and, and see that you know something. So that's the snarks and snarks. So that's, that's been useful um, in a couple of different areas, but I think it's still, um, uh, yeah, so, some of the later work in Ethereum is, is using this as well. Uh, the next thing that's, I would say coming soon, this happens to be the stuff I'm working on. Um, well, not the low level stuff again, like someone has done the libraries for this, brought it into the smart contracts that I'm developing. And uh, what it does is have this beautiful principle that you can um, aggregate signatures. So if you have a lot of um, transactions by individuals and they're, uh, they're all signed by lots of different BLS signatures, generally when you submit that on chain, that's data to be stored. And generally there's a cost with storing data on chain. So this really minimizes the, um, what you need to store for transactions by having one signature, which is the aggregated um, set of signatures rather than just, you know, a signature per transaction. So we've got that code there. So it's actually, um, I realized this 
to aggregate it's just addition so obviously it's letting it overflow but then some normalization but um yeah the idea is that you would have a set of transactions you preserve that data to create a message and the sum of those signatures or the aggregation of those signatures um, can be verified against the full and complete data so that's a handy um way to, to store data there uh, sorry to reduce the data that goes on chain um, just a comment, I think James. Right. Yeah, uh, I was just going to say you mentioned it, letting it overflow. It's probably modulo add, so yeah. it overflow and then wrap around. Yep, yep. I wonder. Oh, that's going to take me there now. No, excellent. Yeah, and that's um, yeah, that's roughly it for me. That's sort of you know the background from what Bitcoin is used in elliptic curves. Some of the stuff that's been around for a few years. Oh, sorry, it's probably been around for long, but has been in use um, for a few years with Ethereum. Um, and further developments to it with Starks and then towards BLS signatures, which is not only the work I'm doing for wallets sort of like today, but also for the next version of Ethereum, if you will. Um, I think we've, we've stopped calling it Ethereum 2, but it's um, the, sort of the proof of stake Ethereum network will be uh, making use of BLS signatures or does make use of BLS signatures. And yeah, any uh, questions so far? Oh, yeah, right. awesome. awesome. So, um... If you are um, keen to hear what questions you have, feel free to unmute and you can ask James yourself. Uh, otherwise, if you're feeling a little bit shy, feel free to pop it in the chat as well. And I'm very happy to voice those questions for you. I have one about BLS. Um, if the signatures are aggregated, does that mean that when you verify, you're verifying effectively all the signatures in one operation? Yep. Yep, you're right. verifying, yeah. yeah, if it's lots of individual uh, transactions as they are, and they used to have individual signatures, you can't really separate them. Um, once the signature is aggregated, you have to verify the whole blob of data. So you are verifying that that entire blob atomically has been signed by all of them. You can't yeah. do any partial checks. That, that makes sense, know, yeah. Is one of the transactions in this signed uh, aggregation? Uh, yeah, you can't do that. And... Um... How, what's, how many signatures would, would you know, you be typically looking to store in an aggregate, aggregated BLS signature? Yeah, so for our use case, it's not actually that many because there's some uh, limit on the Ethereum block size. So you can only have so many transactions in there. So it probably would hit, um, like currently, the, there's actually even a transaction limit right now, which is sub 20. So, you know, if, the, uh, if that sort of expands such that the transaction can fill a block, it will be more than that, but I wouldn't say it would go above a thousand, a hundred to a thousand uh, max. I just, I just don't think it, it will get there. So I guess not too many relative to the resolution, but it is an interesting. Um, yeah, I think, I think are you sort of raising a point that if it's too many, it can get, it can be have some collisions. No, I was just curious um, if what the sort of yeah, use yeah. case was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it sounds like yeah. the signature is in a block, perhaps, or not even. Yeah. So if. Yeah, if a transaction, like if a signature is roughly the size uh, of a quarter of a transaction worth of data for a small transaction, then it's a significant amount when you have like say 100. But even with 20, given the cost um, for some of this, it, it's, uh, yeah, it becomes a good, a good saving to do this. Yeah, fair enough. Yep. Cool. We've got another question from uh, Zarai in the chat. He's asking, sorry, that's a very, uh, very assumptive of me. They have asked, uh, are the BLS signatures in, in Ethereum 2 abstracted from smart contract developers or will they be used in an app developer, uh, used as a app developer, used by an app developer to any degree? Uh, yeah, so uh, currently we're doing it at the smart contract level and they'll be a bit like, um, the goal is that uh, other Ethereum wallets will integrate that signature scheme. So right now it does ECDSA, um, but the, you know, we will want to also do BLS signatures for transactions. So that'll just be inside the wallet, I guess, under the hood for most people. Um, there's also uh, EDDSA, I should have touched upon that. It's just another signature scheme that's gonna be used for some um, semaphore uh, thing that I just don't know enough about, but that's another thing to look up if you like, EDDSA. It's another type of elliptic curve um, thing. But uh, Zarais, did you wanna- Yeah, yeah, thanks else? James. Yeah, no, thanks James for, the, for that. Um, so I'm curious, so if it's clearly just the wallets that are implementing this, you know, multi-sig thing, um, is there anything like, so does the smart contract have to be special to basically accept, hey, like this is a transaction, multiple signatures on it, 
and then does it interpret that in any way? Yeah, good question. So uh, is it still showing my screen, right? Yep. Yes, it is. Uh, no, I'll go to, um, uh, I should have it here. Oh, it's in the other one. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll just open it one moment. So this is the repo I happen to uh, be working on, public repo, and inside the contract section, the contracts, we have a verification gateway, and inside that it uses the, I should be importing the BLS thing there, and in ground here, when I process uh, the transactions, we are, uh, oh yeah, I should have gone to verify, is this going to let me? No. So yeah, so here's where we um, do the check. So it is inside a smart contract, but the idea for this use case would be that, that people have smart contracts, wallet, smart contract wallets. So this I would say is for now that we're putting it at the smart contract layer and not at the protocol layer, but for ETH, uh, for the next version of Ethereum or proof of stake Ethereum, that it is doing this at, a, at the protocol layer. And there's more um, amendments going to do that as well. So right. for yeah. now, this is at the smart contract layer. Right. I'm curious what the use case is here because I'd be from an end user, I would imagine it's pretty difficult to like sign the same transaction from multiple users uh, using MetaMask, like with multiple different, you know. Yeah. Privacy. Yeah. So we also have a, um, yeah, not, I know we're maybe digressing a bit from the cryptography, but yeah, it's um, in, in the extension, it will be sort of seamless. So the idea is that dApps will also um, want, like, the idea of multiple transactions being signed uh, is, an, is a use, is a desire. Like, a lot of people want that, dApps want that. Uh, it's just a usability improvement. Um, this will enable people to do that with a smart contract wallet. So you don't even need BLS signatures for that. But um, it, it just has the advantage of the compression of the signature. But um, but yeah, I think we're drifting a bit off the crypto side, but uh, crypt sorry, cryptography side and into the crypto side. But uh, happy to take it um, afterwards if you like. Yeah, cool. Thanks. It would be great if you could drop some of these links in the chat as well for us to, to have a look at. Yeah, will do. Thanks. My recommendation for that actually is feel free to drop any of the links that you've that you've gone through or things that you think people will be interested in uh, on the meetup event as comments. Just it means okay. folks that weren't able to come to the meetup um, and who are looking at the chat um, will be able to refer back to the stuff afterwards. Great. I'll do that straight after. Perfect. All right. Thanks, James. Um, do we have any more questions for James before we wrap up this awesome first lightning talk? All right, that sounds like no. Well, James, thank you so much for uh, being the first speaker at Encrypt Sid. Um, definitely appreciate you uh, taking the time to, to come and tell us all about the cryptography underneath Web3. Thanks, James. Excellent. Thanks a lot, guys. All right. Well, that was great. Let me fire up the next section. Um, so um, before, we, uh, before we move into the event section, I am curious to hear where people have come from. Uh, uh, feel free to pop that in the chat. But um, are we all Sydney-based? Are we all New South Wales-based? Feel free to unmute as well if you uh, if you want to voice where you're from. It's a bunch of folks from Sydney. Awesome. Well, Mount Colas. Yeah, okay. T technically still in Sydney. Sydney. Sydney for now. Yep, very good. <laughs> Very specific, Woolamaloo. Well, I feel like I may actually be an imposter here because I don't live in Sydney. <laughs> I'm from the central coast, but like the next suburb out of Sydney. So, you know, greater Sydney. How about that? Let's go with that. <laughs> it's true. It is encrypted, but, um, you know, it's worldwide. It's online. All right. Well, thanks you all for volunteering where you're coming from. It's always interesting to see where, uh, where people are phoning in from. So events. So this little section of the meetup, we just talk about um, interesting events that are that are coming up that are uh, cryptography related. And good lord, there are a lot of them. Um, in fact, I have a huge list, and I've just gone. Tell me about the event, or let's just go through the events for the next four months <laughs> because there are just so many events over the next year. Um, and feel free to, uh, if you've got any other events that I haven't touched on when I go through this next little section, feel free to pop them in the uh, in the chat, and uh, I'm happy to uh, happy to voice them as well. I can throw them in at the very end as we as we wrap up. 
So uh, the first conference that's happening fairly soon is the Fast Software Encryption and Conference. Um, so this is by the IACR, uh, which is a pretty, oh yeah, great. We've got Marina that's already popping in the, oh, you stole my thunder, Marina. <laughs> no, actually you haven't. I'll just, don't look at the chat. Look at, look at what I'm saying. Um, so the uh, Fast Software Encryption Conference Hi. is happening in Athens. <laughs> no, it's good, it's good. Um, and the interesting thing about this particular conference is that it is going to be online. In fact, a lot of the uh, the conferences from the IACR have shifted online in the last uh, sort of two years. Uh, they seem to be tapering off from about the middle of this year. Uh, they're going back to, uh, to in-person only. But there's a great opportunity if you haven't been to any of these conferences to, uh, to tag along because, you know, Greece is a long way away, particularly if you're coming from Australia, which apparently we all are. Um, so I highly recommend checking that one out. Uh, we've also got the Real World Crypto Conference is happening in Amsterdam. Uh, and again, that's another uh, IACR organized one. So it's also going to be online. And that's from April 13 to 15. Um, in fact, a bunch of the proceedings, the papers for that, they're proper academic papers that you have to submit to be able to talk at these conferences. I've had a read of a few of them and the content this year is phenomenal. So if you want to get a bit of a, a heads up um, and get a bit of pre-reading in ahead of time, you can also go to these, uh, you can search on Google Scholar for a lot of the papers that are listed in the proceedings. And they also have the papers published as well. Um, so a lot of really awesome content. Real world crypto as well is like definitely for the applied crypto, crypto engineering crowd. Um, so it's some really interesting attacks against real world crypto as well that are being, uh, they're going to be presented at this conference. So I uh, highly recommend you check that out. And um, time zone wise, not too bad as we uh, as we roll into uh, into we should be fully rolled into the uh, out of daylight savings, and they should be into daylight savings. Um, so you don't have to hang around too late to be able to see that conference. Uh, also in May, a little bit later, we've got the forty third IEEE Symposium on Security and Privacy. So this is a bit more broader. Not uh, it's got a bunch of encryption related content, but it's also a bit broader, talking more about privacy and security in general. Um, so this is when the uh, in-person conferences start ramping up and the online ones start tapering off. So this one's going to be in San Francisco. Uh, highly recommend you check that out. There's always lots of really interesting human factors related talks, human factors in security. Um, so particularly about the usability of a lot of the crypto that we build. Um, so highly recommend you check that out. I'm pretty sure that this, the proceedings for this one is, are also being published online. So you might be able to see the papers ahead of time as well. We also have Eurocrypt in May, uh, so that's May 30 to June 3. Uh, they haven't announced whether this one is going to be online yet, uh, but this is the, the big European cryptography conference that's going to be in Trondheim in Norway. Uh, but again, they publish all the papers for this ahead of time as well. Uh, I have a hunch that they will probably be in another um, COVID wave by then, um, so they'll probably do it online. Uh, but watch this space. Um, lots of uh, a bit more on the academic side this particular conference, but always really, really interesting uh, to, to see what what researchers are coming up with. Uh, this one is a little bit off the beaten track. So this is called Histocrypt. I don't know if anybody's run into this before, but this is all about uh, the history of cryptography. So it's happening in Amsterdam. It's going to be uh, face to face in June 20 to 22. Um, and they look particularly at like the, the applications of cryptography, particularly like military cryptography, and they look at it through a historical lens. So, you know, looking back, you know, World War II and prior to that, um, as well as, you know, during the Cold War and, and more recent um, uh, more recent history as well about the use of cryptography. So really, really interesting conference. I highly recommend you check that one out. Uh, also, last one that I'm going to talk about is KawaiCon. Um, so I don't know if, if folks here have been to KiwiCon or PurpleCon or any of the cons of that ilk uh, oh, over in... Yeah, they, go, Marina. Uh, sorry, Nancy, to uh, uh, disturb you. So do you know what's with the KiwiCon? So they just disappear and now KiwiCon is the one which is the uh, main one or they still doing something on the background? Because I think each year they post the controversial news. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, to be honest, I don't know the finer details of it, but I'll give you my understanding, which is that I don't believe they're doing any more KiwiCons. Um, and there was PurpleCon that happened in 2019, and then KawaiCon, which is sort of, PurpleCon was sort of the successor to KiwiCon, and then KawaiCon is the successor to PurpleCon. Um, but I just noticed in the chat that um, Sam Frenchy has piped up and said that he is going to be talking at KawaiCon this year. Um, do you want to do you want to talk a bit about what you're going to talk about, Sam? 
Yeah, for sure. Um, so I, I, I know the crew quite well um, from KiwiCon. So uh, KawaiCon is, is the latest iteration of, of KiwiCon. Basically, some of the family members have been running it for now 10 years and they've got young kids and it just wasn't quite the same thing. Um, but this, it's the spiritual successor. Um, PurpleCon absolutely has been running. PurpleCon will, will, I believe, continue to run. It runs alongside. It's sort of a, a B-side style conference if you've been to any um, security cons. Um, some of it will be streamed, I believe, uh, Marina. Um, but I think it predominantly it's in person. Um, um, they they pushed it back a couple of times. They're kind of hoping for the uh, uh, Aussie borders. Um, sorry, I'll turn my uh, my camera on. As you absolutely pointed out, I have not got that running. Um, sorry, I, mean, you you are, I was just saying hi. No, no, no you're good. You're good. <laughs> um, I, uh, I was planning to stealthily move in and just sort of creep on this. Uh, I only joined halfway, so I haven't, um, haven't been here the whole time. Um, and I've got some light as well, so you can actually see me. Um, but yeah, uh, so uh, that, what I'll be presenting on is um, secrets management. Um, so another good friend of mine runs a company called TruffleSec, um, which is uh, specializes in finding secrets in source. Um, and uh, we're doing a, a joint talk on, you know, how to find secrets in source. And then once you've found it, um, what do you do with them? Um, uh, but yeah, it's um, um, originally it was slated for November last year. It's been pushed back to July. Um, so it'll be a mix of online and in person. Um, but yeah, good to see everyone too. How we can uh, get there virtually or physically? Yeah, uh, best best to follow um, uh, their their website and their Twitter account. That's usually where they post most of the um, the latest info. Uh, and um, yeah, it's it's typically in, in Wellington at the Martin Fowler Centre. Um, so if you're in New Zealand, um, drop by. Um, but uh, if you're not, um, then I'm sure they'll post some links about online availability. Um, but yeah, as uh, as Lindsay absolutely said, really fascinating hackathon. Um, always really good research and fun stuff presented there. I I can't believe I've written Auckland on this slide. Jesus Christ. It's, uh, it's, it's always in Welly just <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's 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 typically a Welly kind. I actually believed in that. I was like, oh, they must talk on such a big event. No. No. My 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 brain did a collapsing function on all of New Zealand. It's like this is one city, right? It's just Auckland. No, that is absolutely Pretty much, not the yeah, case. Basically. There's only five million people. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's one it's one Aussie city. <laughs> Be a shame that I recently discovered Auckland, the same spelling in uh, New South Wales, I think. Uh, the very small town. So, yeah. There you go. Maybe that's where the, the next key week on could be in uh, Auckland and New South Wales. <laughs> um, Sam, if you want to give like a light version of that talk as a way to sort of like warm up, um, you are more than welcome to come to a, a, an upcoming encrypted meetup and, and give us a bit of a preview. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think there, there'd be some interesting overlap uh, there as well. Um, uh, as soon as I've written it, um, I'll be sure. <laughs> it's definitely one of those like submit the CFP and we'll see if it gets accepted. And oh crap! Now I got to now I got to write something. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, that's great. Um, yeah. Well, hopefully folks can get over there and the, the borders will be open up nicely. Um, yeah. That's that sounds absolutely awesome. All right. Well, that's the end for events. Um, I'm curious. Uh, I don't think I saw any other events that popped up in the chat, but if anybody's got any other events that I haven't captured, um, feel free to unmute or, or pop in the chat and, uh, and let us know about that quickly. And if you think about it during the next talk as well, feel free to pop it in the chat and I'll talk about it at the very end as we wrap up. All right. Well, let's roll into the second and final talk for this evening. Uh, we've got Dan talking about why authentication matters in cryptography. Dan, I'm going to stop screen sharing and hand it to you. Cool, bananas. I'll share my screen. It's always a process in Zoom on Linux. Let's see how we go. Okay. Can you see my screen? We can see a big block over it that looks like zoom yeah there we go it's it was zoom. yeah yeah yep. okay so you should see the importance of authentication on the screen and that's about it it's looking great okay cool <laughs> great just sometimes I, I end up sharing my second monitor by mistake um anyway so uh importance of authentication and in this talk i'm i'm not referring to identifying an individual or authorizing an individual i'm talking about uh authenticating a message like you know think about the kind of old school interpretation of authenticating a message to make sure it's it is what we think it is um and so if you think about uh cryptography or encryption in general you know the the simplest form of encryption is the idea of symmetric encryption where you've got um two parties say call them alice and bob and they both have a shared key and alice uh uses that key to send an encrypted message to bob uh, it's not rocket science 
Um, <clears throat> and the most common sort of variant of this symmetric encryption um, technology or approach is AES, Advanced Encryption Standard. Um, you've probably all heard of that. Um, and obviously AES takes a, uh, has a function to call encrypt, uh, which takes a plain text. In this case, I've just got dog and some zero padding and that outputs a ciphertext. And then a decryption function, which takes that ciphertext and uh, with the same key and outputs the original plain text. Very, very simple. Now, the thing is, we actually really never use AES in that way. This, this, this mechanism is, is just really a very simple block cipher. It's often referred to as ECB or electronic codebook. Um, and on its own, it's not very secure uh, and not particularly useful unless you've got very specific use cases. So what we tend to do when we're using AES is we're using uh, AES in what's called a mode of operation. So this is the web crypto um, API uh, documentation, which is uh, a relatively recent uh, API that's been made available in, in lots of browsers. It's a W3 standard. Um, and the web crypto API provides three modes of operation, counter mode, CBC, and GCM. Now, you would be forgiven if you've not really studied this stuff and you're not familiar with the different pros and cons of saying, well, which one do I use? How do I know which mode I should use? Um, and the problem is that which mode you use is incredibly important and has a big impact on security. So let's try to understand that a bit more. So you look at the modes, there's, there's sort of, there's lots of other dimensions that you wanna think about, but the two main ones you wanna think about are, is encryption randomized? Um, and we could probably do a whole talk on randomized encryption, but uh, suffice to say for this talk, you want randomized encryption, not deterministic encryption. Um, ECB, that's the electronic code book, um, kind of think of that as AES running without any mode of operation at all is not randomized. So you don't wanna use that really ever. CBC, that's cipher block chaining counter mode and Galois counter mode um, are all randomized. So they're all good in that regard. But then if we look at it through this other dimension, authenticity, uh, only GCM in, in the list that, that Web Crypto provide anyway, um, provides authenticity. There are other modes uh, that provide authenticity, but not necessarily available in the API that we're talking about here. So what the hell is authenticity mean in a cryptographic context? Let's take a uh, scenario once again, when Alice wants to send Bob a message, but this time she's sending a message that contains an instruction. And so she's saying to Bob, can you please pay Eve $10? Okay, uh, that's fine. Um, it's, it's encrypted, it should be secret. No one can see that um, Alice has asked Bob to pay Eve $10. But what happens if Eve is able to intercept that message and modify it? Now, even if she can't see it, she can still modify the ciphertext. She doesn't necessarily know what the message is, but if she's, she can work out through some side chain or through some social engineering, what the message is about, then she can modify it in transit and that can have a pretty dramatic effect. So what she could do here, for example, is modify the message to say, instead of paying you $10, she can pay herself $1,000 or whatever. Um, so we, and the problem here is that Bob has no idea he can't verify whether that message has been tampered with. So as far as he's concerned, um, Alice is asking him to pay either thousand dollars. So you can see that's a, a pretty major problem. Um, and if you think about uh, as, as an example here, so using CPC mode, cipher block training mode, and by the way, uh, I've worked with a lot of engineers in who have, you know, writing cryptographic protocols and so forth before, uh, or using encryption in their applications. And a lot of the documentation um, that the libraries um, uh, include often refer to CBC mode as being the mode you should use. Historically, maybe that was the case. It's certainly not the case in 2022. Um, and so I think uh, it's really worth pointing out that CBC mode for the vast majority of applications is really not secure. So let's go through an example as to why. So when you're encrypting something using CBC mode, uh, you need a couple of um, values. So first you need a, an IV or initialization vector, sometimes called a nonce. Um, I'm using a, a 16, um, 16 byte nonce, which is probably overkill, but it's fine. Um, then we're going to generate our ciphertext. So that's the encrypted version of our, um, our message using the encrypt function inside the API. We're just specifying uh, the algorithm to use. So it's AES in CBC mode, and we're giving it the IV. Uh, side note, if you've never done anything like this before, please always generate a new fresh IV every time you're encrypting. 
Um, repeated IVs are a common um, source of um, insecurities. Uh, and then the, my last parameter in this function is just the message that I want to set. So I'm, I'm just encoding a, a JSON, a uh, bit of JSON, which has got the amount and uh, some ID. So, you know, that's the ID of the message set. Uh, and then my function's just going to return uh, the IV and the slash text. The IV itself is not sensitive. We just need to make sure that the IV is never repeated. So we can send that along with our message. Um, okay, so before we go any further, it's worth just digging in a little bit to how CBC works. So if you think about AES as an encryption standard, it's called a block encryption cipher, a block cipher. Uh, and that's because it only works on a block of 16 bytes. Um, and so we actually have more than 16 bytes most of the time when we're encrypting something, encrypting a document or a message. So uh, CBC is um, one of the ways, and as, as with all uh, encryption modes, a block cipher modes, it's one of the ways that you can encrypt longer messages. And so the, way, the particular way that CBC does this is it chains the blocks together, hence cipher block chaining. And so what it's doing here in the uh, encrypt function, is it's taking your initialization vector, it's XORing it with the plain text block, and then taking that input, putting it into the block cipher, which is using your key, and then out, that outputs the first ciphertext block, so that's 16 bytes long. And then it basically takes that as sort of the inverted commas, the IV for the next uh, block. And so it will just keep chaining that for as many blocks as it needs. And so your output message will be um, n times 16 in uh, bytes in length, so some, uh, some multiple of, of the block. Um, the decrypt function is basically the reverse of that. Uh, it takes the IV once again, um, but this time it does it after the AES decrypt function. So it takes the site text block, decrypts it, and then XORs that output with the IV and then continues throughout the block. So really very simple in that regard. But there's a pretty major flaw with CBC in the way that this works. If I want to modify the ciphertext, all I actually need to do is modify, uh, well, actually I could modify the ciphertext, but I don't know what that's going to result in because I don't know the key. So what I can do though, is just modify the IV. And so let's say that I wanted to uh, change this particular byte here. And I'll show you why, why that particular byte is interesting to me in a minute. Um, and now when I go through this process and I decrypt, uh, the, whatever the output of the ciphertext will be, will actually be XORed with this. So I can choose a value in this IV such that the plain text output will give me a specific value. Now, I don't know which, uh, what, what um, value I'm XORing it with, because I, I don't know what the key is and I don't know what the decrypted value will be, but there's only, it's only one byte. So there's only 256 possibilities. So it's not, it's not a very large space of values to try. Um, if you think about the example I used before, if you're uh, trying to modify a message where somebody has asked to send you $10, 10 is a fairly low value in the, ASCII chart, so you could, in the, in the, uh, sorry, in the range of 256, so you could uh, change it to anything. And there's a reasonably high probability that you change it to something more than 10 anyway. So even if you just pot luck, you're probably gonna do, do better than, uh, than what was intended. Anyway, I'm diverging a little bit. So now what's gonna happen here, this shows you what uh, Eve can do if she intercepts this message. So she's gonna take that message, remember it was just an IV and a ciphertext, gonna de destructure it, sorry about all the JavaScript, um, then I'm going to modify the 10th byte with this byte. Now I happen to have just done a uh, experiment before I did a, a few random trials and worked out what, what byte I would want to set that to such that I get a particular output. And then all she's gonna do is pass on the IV and the site text once again. And now Bob is going to do the decrypt function. He is none the wiser that anything has happened. Um, He's decrypting, he takes his IV, takes the IV and takes the ciphertext. But now the amount has changed from 1000 to 9000. So this is the 10th byte and I've modified it. So now I've tampered the message, tampered with the message, or Eve has tampered with the message, and Bob is none the wiser. And CBC has no way of preventing that. Um, this is obviously a very simple case. Real world situations are often much more complex. But for a motivated attacker who has you know, any kind of understanding about um, cipher block chaining, uh, it's really very easy to do some pretty horrendous stuff. And so I think there's this um, um, myth that once something's encrypted, it's safe. Uh, and that's certainly not 
the case, not necessarily the case. So what we really want to use uh, in this case is a well, we really want to use an authenticated mode of operation for AES, and and really um, probably the best one for, for for almost all cases in in uh, contemporary use is AES and GCM. That's Galois counter mode. Um, it works a little bit differently to how I'm demonstrating here. I'm sort of showing a simplified um, version of it just for illustration purposes. But if, if anyone's familiar with Galois fields and, math, and the math behind it, please don't hate on me because I'm not doing that justice. Um, so how you would encrypt with GCM, it's basically the same uh, process. It looks, it looks almost exactly the same as the CBC mode. But now you're just specifying GCM mode. And so the, the web crypto library really handles all, all of the hard work for you. Um, but now if I tried to do the same thing that happened before, uh, that I did before by modifying um, the IV before trying to decrypt, I get an exception. So basically what um, uh, the web crypto library is going, ah, oh, shit, this is being tampered with, I'm going to ignore it. Um, and so you should always, you should always um, drop a message uh, if it's if it's been tampered with. Uh, in actual fact, the way Galois works in particular is that it, you can't even decrypt it if it's been tampered with. Um, other, other particular schemes of authentication uh, will still allow you to decrypt it even if it hasn't um, uh, haven't, haven't passed the authentic authenticity check. So once again, Galois is probably the best one to use. Um, so if looking at that a little bit further, um, the way that the way that um, authentication works in, in these schemes, like I say, Galois works slightly differently, but essentially you can think of it as analogous to having a tag, or it does have a tag, but calculates it slightly differently. Um, so you've got in your message now the IV and the ciphertext as you did before, but now you've got this idea of a tag, sometimes called a message authentication code. Um, your ciphertext uh, and tag are sent to um, your recipient, and if the recipient notices or sees that the you get the ciphertext and it's changed, what's going to happen is that they will now uh, need to verify that the tag matches the original message. So let's say Bob um, Bob gets this message, he's going to call this, this is pseudo code, this fictitious method called gen tag with a key um, on the ciphertext. And if that tag that he generates doesn't match the tag that he was given, then he knows to discard the message. Um, and so essentially it's Technically, it would be possible for somebody to tamper with both the message and the tag such that they matched, but because of the extremely large numbers we're talking about, uh, it's it's basically impossible. It's infeasible uh, that that an attacker would be able to generate uh, a valid ciphertext and a valid tag, or modify a ciphertext and generate a valid tag. So this gives us a very high level of protection. I.e., it gives us the authentic authenticity of a message. Uh, and there's another advantage in, in using authentication with um, uh, with our encryption scheme, and that's the idea of associated data. So associated data is not necessarily secret, but it is something that we want to be tamper-proof. Uh, and so a common pattern for um, associated data or AAD, associate, authenticated associated data, um, is to include the ID of the key that was used to encrypt it. And so that way, when, when uh, Alice sends a message to Bob, she can include the key ID, which is itself not sensitive, so that Bob knows which key to use to, to decrypt it. Um, and of course, we don't necessarily mind if Bob sees the ID, we need him to see the ID. We don't mind if anyone else sees the ID. What we want to make sure is that the key ID itself hasn't been tampered with. Because uh, obviously, if we didn't have any authentication, that would cause problems. So authenticated associated data is a very useful uh, component. Um, and it only, only comes along with um, uh, you know, these authenticated schemes, so GCM being the main one. So uh, the NIST, uh, National Institute for Science and Technology in the US, publishes a set of recommendations. Um, if, if you are playing around with uh, cryptography and you're using GCM, I recommend you have a look at their guide. It gives you um, guidelines on uh, how big an IV you should use, how many bytes the tag should be, and, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, so recommend looking at that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's just some information about me. You can follow me on Twitter. Feel free to email me anytime you like. I always love talking about crypto and um, you can check us out at cyphersash.com. So that's uh, that's it for me. Happy to answer any questions. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm curious to hear what questions that you have. Feel free to either unmute or pop them in the chat and I'm happy to relay them as well. Clear as mud. 
<laughs> Clearly you've nailed it because there's no questions. <laughs> all right. I have a quick question, sorry. Um, are all of the different AES modes all baked into hardware now or are only the basic modes hardware supported in your CPU? Uh, that's a very interesting question. I, I don't think, most CPUs I don't think actually include the specific mode of operation. I think they just include the basic block cipher. And, right. the, and it's, it's then um, additional software on top of that, that that makes it work in a particular mode. So, you know, adding XORs and things like that. Um, so I, as far as I know, there's there's no CPUs that have like GCM specifically. I think there's there's just a low level block cipher. I, I'm, I'm like 70% sure on that. Marina, do, do you know if that's, can you verify that? I can try. Oh, you're not sure? Okay, if you don't know, that's fine. <laughs> I assumed you might know the answer. Uh, I'm pretty, I'm pretty certain that's the case, but uh, I, I might take that one on notice, James. <laughs> cool, thank you. Oh, or James, if you do the research and find the answer to that, it would be a great lightning talk to hear about. Uh, It'll be a very quick lightning talk. <laughs> <laughs> it's called lightning talk for a reason. It'll be done in like sixty seconds. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll do some Googling. Brilliant. Well, just just a side note, one of the other advantages of GCM, um, if you recall, I mentioned that cipher block chaining requires your message to be a multiple of the block, so a multiple of 16 bytes. GCM doesn't. Um, so you you actually, your ciphertext size directly mirrors the, um, the input size. So anyway, it's a fun fact. Brilliant. All right, yeah, well, just a quick note for some of the uh, algorithms, it maybe really depends on the implementation. Uh, because even if the algorithm has a um, limitation for the size of the block, uh, you can implement it the way it actually will on on ongoing, uh, like online, uh, cut the uh, message to the certain uh, sizes. So, um, yeah, that's fair enough. Uh, all I mean to say is that. CBC has that limitation, whereas GCM doesn't have the limitation. So, yeah. Yep. Good call. Brilliant. All right. Well, let's roll into the final bit then. Um, one last thing before we wrap up. Thank you all for, for attending on the first, uh, the inaugural uh, Encrypt Sid meetup. Um, the last thing is uh, we are intending to do the meetup monthly at this point. So we want to do the next one in March. Um, so we're aiming for the second Thursday of the month, um, roughly. Um, that may that may change, but we want to we want to keep a pretty regular cadence to this. Um, we need you to speak. So if you uh, saw something tonight and thought I could do that, um, feel free to put up a talk. Um, we would love to hear you. Uh, you know, and it, it, you don't have to be an expert in any of this. Um, you know, even just uh, uh, if, if this is your first presentation, even that would be totally fine. Um, you know, this is we're trying to make a, a, a safe an environment as possible where folks can uh, you know, folks can share and learn and discuss. So um, we would just love to have anything that you want to talk about. Um, Sam, I'm definitely going to follow up with you. We would love to see uh, a little bit of your, <laughs> your Kawaiicon talk. Um, and yeah, if anybody else has uh, been inspired, we would uh, we'd definitely love to see anything that you've got. All right, that's it. Thank you so much for coming and uh, see you all in March. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. That was fantastic. See Thank you. Cheers.